1995. I had just graduated from London School of Economics. And I was going to go straight into banking because I wanted to be a master of the universe and handle lots of cash. That was great. Now, um, forward four years later, and I collapse on the floor in the office um, from an excess of caffeine, which 18 coffees a day will do to you, uh, and a lack of sleep, four hours a night on average. And so when I was recuperating, I thought, if I'm going to work this hard, it better be on something that I'm really passionate about. Now, at the time, I always wanted to go into films, but I thought it was for the privileged few who were born into this or something. I didn't know you could actually make a living out of it. But of course you could. So I sent CVs off to Hollywood. And I went there for interviews, and uh, I secured a job as the assistant to the producer of Saving Private Ryan, Gary Levinson, which was awesome. <laughs> so I came back to London ready to pack, and I'm like, ah. I'm off, and I found a letter from the French army saying, young man, you have not done your compulsory military service right this way, please. And so uh, I said goodbye to La La Land, and I went to the army, and uh, I was stationed on a combat helicopter base just north of Paris. Since I had to do this, I thought, okay, let's, let's take advantage of it. So I went through officer's training, and I learned how to manage people how to manage resources and so on. And I thought, okay, well, this is like production. So why should I go work for somebody when I can just do it myself? And I just entered the magical world of independent production. After the army, I went into the usual path. You do short films, you do commercials, you do music videos. And ironically, I was working nights for the very same bank I used to be a banker at. No one realized it at the time. Um, after a little bit of time, I got to the stage where I was confident enough to package my first feature film. And I thought, of course, it's going to be great. It was a basic story of five people who trade success for a soul, not their own. They, need ten year, they have 10 years to kill somebody. Of course, nobody does. And at the school reunion, they get locked into the school by the guy they did the deal with, and they have until dawn to deliver a soul. So they kill each other. Um, it was a fitting sort of symbol for banking. Um, <laughs> And so from there, I thought, this is going to work. This is going to be great. I'm, yeah, people are going to be throwing money at me. No, they did not. And um, after knocking on a lot of doors, uh, I got to the stage where I thought, this is, this is never going to happen. I'm, I'm just not cut out for this. This is not it. And then some friends of mine went, well, look, come and do this short film with us. It'll take your mind off things. And I just channeled all my frustration and all everything that I felt I, I deserved, rightly or wrongly, into this short film. Now, normally the way you do a short film is you start with what you have access to. Car, an apartment, someone's restaurant, whatever you can con yourself into. And you build a story around that. Here, we did the opposite. Um, we had gunfights and sword fights in our script, and we had multiple locations and places you're not allowed to film in and things like that. And we did it all. And we never missed a single thing that we planned, and, and, and we came out with what we wanted. And I saw this on a big screen in the cinema. And at that point, it dawned on me, I don't need money to make a film. I don't have to wait for people to validate my efforts. I can just use the power of plastic. <laughs> so I reached into my pocket, looked at my budget, my credit card, uh, and proceeded to plan my film. Now, obviously, you have to adapt to this kind of budget. So um, there are different locations. You can't pay for things, so you have to get locations for, for free. You uh, have to adjust the cast, because some of them don't want to work for free. My lead cast dropped out. I cast a better guy, so it's good. Um, and, uh, and of course, schedule, because you have to work fast, because you work cheap. Um, in order to work cheap, you try to get stuff for free. That usually involves suckers. Uh, so you find people who are going to give you things thinking it's their in, in their own interest. So I, I needed a school location. I used the school from the guys who did the short film with, and uh, I got that for free. The same school um, was mad enough to give me their camera equipment for free, their lights and all sorts of other things. So that was great. Um, also, instead of renting things, I thought, well, I can just buy secondhand on eBay, sell it afterwards for the same price. And that's not going to cost me a thing. Worked out mostly. Um, 
And after that, trying to get stuff for free, you end up doing a lot of things yourself so you don't have to pay anyone. So on this one, I wrote, I produced, I directed, um, I shot the film, I did most of the admin and legal work, um, I handled catering, uh, production design, oh, and I did stunts. Now that was cool. That was cool. There was a scene where uh, the, the bad guy in the film is very casually, because he's cool, he's the bad guy, uh, throwing the good guy over his shoulder and send him crashing into a library table. Now, of course, the lead actor, as good as he was, was a little bit reluctant to crash through a table. Um, so I built a table in my living room. Uh, I pointed a camera at it, and I proceeded to jump through it. It hurt. <laughs> but, you know, it was worth it. It was a cool shot. It seamlessly integrated into the film. Because the thing is, it hurts when you land. But then you have to figure out, wait, what position was he in when I did the pickup shot on the other side? Because it has to match. So you're like, oh, that's right. It's like, oh, left elbow up. Uh, uh. And then you hope in the edit suite it's going to work out. And it did. So it's good. Um, obviously, you can't do everything yourself. So at some point, you have to build a team. And the way I did that was I couldn't pay everybody. So I said, look, we're doing this for no money. I'll give you a percentage of revenue. People believe me. <laughs> um, and, uh, and you give people multiple tasks. So my makeup artist was my production coordinator. Um, the director of photography handled grip equipment. Um, anytime there was something to move on set, I grabbed one of the actors who wasn't in the scene and said, could you carry that just over there? Because I'm the director, I can do what I want. Um, and we all came together. We, uh, we were a solid crew, solid team. And we proceeded to enter a world of hurt. Because shooting a film in 14 nights, which is all we could afford, means that you're shooting five and a half pages a day of script. On an average normal film with money, you shoot one or two. So obviously I didn't sleep for 14 nights because during the day I was solving production problems that happened, like losing a location at the last minute, which you replace and you realize that you can only shoot half a day in a, f in a location where you're supposed to shoot a full day, but you take it in stride. Um, and ultimately, um, I ended up with uh, a finished film and I was ready to go into the edit suite because, of course, I edited the film too and I mixed it and I did the titles because I don't know what I was thinking. Anyway, um, the, I was so eager to show this film because I thought everybody's going to want to see it. No, because they don't know it exists and they won't know until you show it to distributors who will put it in cinemas for you. So I was so eager, I showed a rough cut. I thought they're professionals, they know how to extrapolate. They will see my vision, this thing, this beautiful thing. And I did a screening in a theater where I stood by the door thinking, if anyone dares to walk out, I want to see their face. <laughs> so I saw the face of pretty much everybody I invited that night. <laughs> walk through in about the first 15 minutes. And that's like a stab through the heart every time. Because they smile too. It was like, yeah, thanks, this is wasting my time, man. <laughs> and just, they leave, and it's crushing. But you learn the lesson, right? You apply the lesson, you keep going. So I refined the cut, put some new music on it, it all looked good, it was cool, and I thought, okay, let me go all in. I've got money left, the, the final piece of the credit card, I, you know, the bank's not going to arrest me yet. I went to camp. Now, camp is a market where you can show your films and present it to distributors from all over the world. And I did that, and... It, doesn't, it sounds very glamorous, but I was staying at a camping site and I had a scooter to go to the Palais des Festivals where everything happens. And I was reading ravioli every day, so not quite the steps that you think of. Um, and I was waiting for a distributor to, yes, 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 your film, fantastic, I want it. You, you, <laughs> no, no that, didn't, that didn't happen either. Um, so I got back to London and I thought, that, okay, I, I gotta be a baker or something. Um, because, no, and um, I'm, I'm glad to say that this has, this has a happy ending, because I go back to London and I got the call. It only takes one call. I got the call, Shoreline Entertainment, sales agent in LA said, we saw the film, we love it, we want to represent it for international distribution. So this became the movie poster. Um, it then changed because it was sold in multiple territories. So in the US it was this. I have no idea here. In Japan, it was this. I, 
but hey, it sold, you know? And, and the exercise was to take it from an idea all the way to a distributed film. And more than just the success of, of doing that, what it created was opportunities. And it was opportunities not uh, not in the way you think, but it was opportunities for my cast. The, the lead actor got a major role in a, uh, UK, a very uh, strong TV series in the UK called Holby City after this film. The makeup artist became a production coordinator, made a career out of it. The DP went on to do his short films, worked on features in his native Spain, um, and I came here. So, uh, and, and now I'm, uh, I want to share this with people, and in fact I'm working on a, a program to, uh, to uh, identify six Emirati women students to take them on a 10-month journey to produce a feature film using these techniques, hopefully less drastic. Um, and what I took away from that and the message I want you to take away from this is that stories matter because they inspire people, they inform people, they educate, they entertain, they, they affect people, and they don't affect people necessarily because of the story you're telling, but it affects people because you are telling it. All of these beautiful things that came out of this film came because we did it. And when you tell stories and you affect people, in effect you're changing people. And so I believe that with stories you can change the world one story at a time if you're prepared to do whatever it takes to tell your story. Thank you.